So um, without further ado, I think I should turn things over to Brian uh, for our presentation. Thank you so much, Ansel. I'm gonna send in the chat the link to my slides, and then um, if that's all right, I'll also share my screen to just kind of walk you through a few points and a few examples. Um, yeah, I want the whole screen, so let's click on share. All right, you should be able to see a title slide now, so that's good. Uh, I and a few of you have logged into that, so that's wonderful. Um, so I, um, our, our department offers a course called um, Aviation Physics. It is um, intended for students who are training to become commercial pilots. And I see that my slides are taking a second to load, so I'll give them another, okay, there we go. Um, so this is a course intended for students um, training to become commercial pilots while also obtaining a business degree. And I've found it's actually works out pretty well to integrate some coding into the class, even though it's not um, an explicit learning objective of the course. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, since that was a topic, I, I offered to kind of give that as an example. Um, I, don't def I definitely don't have an answer to how do you integrate computation in a course where programming is not an objective, but this is at least an example that I can walk us through. Um, so like I said, this is called Aviation Physics. I'll go over a little bit more information about the course. Um, I'll talk about what my goals are for integrating computation into the course. Um, and then I'll walk you through a few of the activities that I've used in the class and talk about how that turns out and what the students like and don't like about it. Um, so like I said, this, is, this course is for students majoring in aviation management and flight operations. So they are getting their commercial pilot license while also completing an aviation-centered business major. Um, so that they can ascend the ranks into management. Um, and nearly all of these students are underprepared mathematically and under-motivated in terms of studying for the course. So for many of them, it's been several years since they've had a math class. Uh, these are not STEM majors or technical majors by any stretch. Um, and many of them, they are taking it because it's a major requirement. Uh, they don't understand why the course isn't taught by a pilot because they see aviation in the title and they think it's their course. They don't think of it as a physics course. Um, and so we include in this class two weeks of algebra review and trig review just to make sure they're all up to speed for the, uh, for the, for the few and, and simple problems that we have them work out. And so the learning objectives for this course are primarily qualitative. Um, we want them to come out appreciating the relevance of physics in their lives, and we want them to become conversationally fluent about forces and energy so that they can talk at least somewhat intelligently about what's going on with their plane, maybe with a mechanic or with uh, an, aer an, an aerospace engineer. Um, but we certainly don't expect them to be solving physics problems while they are flying their airplanes. We would rather them not be doing that. Um, and so computer programming is definitely not a learning objective. But it is helpful in terms of helping them develop that qualitative um, appreciation and fluency. And oddly enough, they end up liking it. Um, and so it's, it's ironic. They enjoy it some more than, uh, uh, than some of our STEM majors do when they are required to do it. And it's part of the, the course objectives. Um, so when I, when I first present coding to them in class, I tell them that they are not expected to remember any coding practices by the end of the semester, that they're not being assessed on how good of a programmer they are, that, that this is simply to help them learn. But I also tell them that you know, they don't know what their careers will require of them in the future. Um, a lot of them are getting into um, uh, doing projects with drones, and that certainly can incorporate some coding. And so I tell them that, that they may need to evaluate a code someday or modify a code or at least understand how it's working. So it is, it's useful for them to at least have had that experience. And so I designed the coding activities to primarily support the visualization of what's going on. So we use uh, vPython via Trinket. Um, and we, uh, and it, and it, it's designed to help them with that conversational fluency by having them do a qualitative write-up of, uh, of the coding activity. I don't really have them do a whole lot of technical analysis of it. It's mostly describe to me what the code, what the animation did. And of course, since they are focused on aeronautics, I try to incorporate aircraft and flight at every opportunity that I can. Um, so, and that starts with the first week, uh, where I want them to learn a little bit about the Python. I want them to become comfortable with it and to start thinking about vectors in three dimensions. And so what I do the first week is tell them that we want to use this uh, programming package vPython that can animate your airplane, but vPython does not have an airplane object, oddly enough. And so for the first assignment, I asked them to 
create for me an airplane. What I want to show you now is uh, some of the um, codes that they've written to accomplish that. So here's the first example I want to show. Uh, so I told them, uh, basically I give them a starter code that's got a few shapes and I basically tell them, you know, you've got control over two things. You've got control over the position of each shape and the size of each shape. And for some of them, you also have control over the direction that it points. And uh, I told them, just make me an airplane. I, I don't know how to do that myself. So you, you need to go and make me an airplane so we can use it in your codes. And here's an example of one that I think came out pretty well, right? So this, the students looking at this, they say, yeah, that looks like an airplane. And then you go to rotate it. And this is what it looks like. And so this is an interesting problem to have because the students have gotten it to work in two dimensions. And then I went to rotate it in class and said, I don't think this looks like a plane in three dimensions because this is the view you would rather have of the plane, certainly uh, would be the, the side view during an animation. And this was not unique to this student. Uh, this actually came out in um, a few of these codes where it looks great uh, from a top down view, but then from the side view, uh, it, it the, the, the shapes aren't matching up. So the students are, are definitely leaning on just that one projection of the view rather than the entire three-dimensional view. But that's actually a neat opportunity to talk about, you know, this concept of vectors and projection and, you know, how things look differently, you know, in a 3D space. And apparently my internet has decided to crawl. So I'll just skip that example, I think. Oops. And of course, then it just came up. Okay. But I think you get the idea. So the, the goal of this first activity is just to get them to use their creativity, right? There's no real physics involved here. Nothing's moving, there's no forces, but it's just to get them comfortable with the programming environment and to get them to start thinking in terms of these 3D vectors. And honestly, just to give them a little bit of confidence that they did in fact build an airplane successfully. Um, then we, we, so we, we, we move along with that and then I actually use the best looking airplane in the animations, which you'll see in this next one. So in week two, we want them to start thinking about uh, velocity concepts. Uh, we want them to start thinking about, you know, rate of change, delta x over delta t. Um, and so the goal for this activity is to reinforce those velocity concepts while also learning how to create an animation. And so here we've got a code, uh, and I, I set up most of this. I took the, the best student airplane from the first week assignment, and I just copied and pasted that into here. So it's it's probably not as clean as it could be, but it, it works out pretty well. And then basically what we do is we, we animate this thing. There we go. There it is. Let me see if I can zoom in. This was the airplane that they were most proud of. There we go. It looks more or less like an airplane. It's pretty good. Um, and basically what we're doing here is just animating this airplane flight in three stages. So we've got a, a takeoff, a cruise, and then a landing. And so we would look at this as physicists and say, no, but it doesn't go through those discrete changes. It's gotta be smoother, right? It's gotta be, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's gotta have some, some force to it. But this, this, is, this is enough of a stretch for them the first week. And so, yeah, there we've got that, you know, that nice little jagged part in the trajectory there. Um, but part of the goal is also to get them to start looking at graphs of the motion. So here we've got a graph of the X position versus time. And I've only set it up for the X and I've only set it up in that first stage of the animation. So the next goal in their assignment is to add in the Y graph and then do the same thing for the, um, for the, for the cruising part of the animation and then for the uh, landing part of the animation. And it just gets them to think about, you know, what is going to change about the graph here um, and match that up with the, uh, with the animation up here. <clears throat> Um, and then we, we go through a few more weeks where I don't have as much aviation stuff as I would like. That's still something I'm working on. But then after we do our chapter on forces, um, we move into a chapter on flight dynamics where we put the four, floor, four forces on an airplane. And the goal is for them to learn that an airplane flight is stable and then communicate that stability to a loved one. So I ask them to pick somebody that they know who is afraid of flying and use this next code to convince them that flying is in fact safe, that it's a, that it's a stable equilibrium point uh, in the motion. And so this is, this is the most complicated code that I give them because we have to put in the, the lift, the thrust, the drag. We have to get a lift to drag ratio, all of this stuff. And so the goal here is for the students to just look at the airplane's motion once they've set up the, the thrust and the weight and everything. And so when we first start out with this code, here's the airplane with the four forces. And I needed some way to depict the motion. Um, 
And so I have these, these flying saucer clouds passing by it to indicate the motion in the, in the window. Um, it's, it's clear here in the trajectory. So this is the trajectory it, it follows in the sky, y versus x. And what you see here is that the plane is descending because as the students would tell me, it doesn't have enough speed. Without enough speed, it doesn't have enough lift. And what I want them to notice about this is that it starts to fall, but eventually that falling kind of starts to level out here because as it is falling, it is accelerating. And that acceleration is going to increase the velocity enough to get more lift. And so the goal is for them to watch this lift vector here start to grow so that they can see how the airplane's flight corrects itself. Now, obviously, this is an exaggeration. We would not want our airplanes to dip this much. But what we eventually see is that uh, the airplane kind of levels out. It actually ends up then picking itself back up a little bit because it's got this self-correcting uh, relationship between the lift and the drag as long as the thrust is set correctly. And of course, the, the thrust value is the thing that they control in the cockpit. And so this is actually a pretty good um, emphasis on what they can control versus what uh, physics kind of has the control of. And so again, I don't really expect them to do much um, quantitatively with this activity. My main goal is for them to explain how it works and what it means to a loved one with the goal of helping them you know, overcome some, some hesitation to fly. Um, and I find that that's a really, <clears throat> excuse me, I find that that's a really neat way for them to wrap up that activity because, you know, the, they, they will have to deal with the public as a, as a pilot. Um, you know, they'll have to talk to their passengers, they'll have to talk to people in the airport, and they, you know, they want to be able to have, you know, those kind of, of conversations. Um, let's see here. I think that brings me to my last slide. So let me just tell you a little bit about, um, how this, uh, how this works out. Um, so it's interesting to me to see that the aviation students actually do enjoy some low intensity code modification. It's certainly not as technical as we get into in my calc-based physics sections, um, but it is interesting that they're able to learn a little bit. They end up liking it. Um, the visualization does help, but I do wonder if there are still some cognitive roadblocks. So one of the things that a lot of these students will tell me when they come in the class is that during flight, all the forces are equal. And I look, I have them look at this and I ask them, do these red arrows, do those forces look equal? And they say, no. And I say, okay, so the, no, the forces are not necessarily equal. And then they turn around and they say, yeah, because the thrust has to be greater than the drag or else the plane won't move. And then I, you know, I, I, I scratch my head again and I say, but what if the plane is, is flying in cruising flight? Then, then the thrust equals the drag. And they say, no, the, the thrust has to be bigger than the drag, but all the forces have to be equal. And so there's... <laughs> They're using those words differently than, than I think they're using them, at least I'm hoping. Um, but there's, there's a little bit of, of, of cognitive dissonance there in the student's understanding that I am still working on figuring out how to address. Um, these airplanes are definitely great to feature in the code, but I do wonder if we're getting there a bit too late. Like I said, we have this uh, gap of about uh, eight weeks where we don't have any airplane related simulations. And so the students kind of lose interest by that point. And so when we finally get around to that flight simulation, um, they're maybe not as, as attentive or interested as they should be. So my next goal for this course, um, I've only introduced uh, coding into it for the last uh, couple of semesters. My next goal when I teach it again uh, next fall is going to be to introduce Tracker into the labs and focus on making comparisons between the data we get in Tracker and the models that we develop in DPython, because I think they'll enjoy the video analysis aspect of Tracker. Um, a little bit more than they enjoy the kind of standard cookbook labs that we've been doing. And maybe I can use that to get airplanes in sooner. If, if they are, you know, going up in the, going out to the airport and getting up in the sky, maybe they can get a video with their buddy's airplane taking off. That would be a cool tracker experiment to do. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's all I wanted to share. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time and um, hand it back over to Ansel. All right. Awesome. Thank you very much for the presentation. That was really thank cool. You. Uh, I think we should definitely have some time here for questions. Uh, I will say on a tech note, um, I can definitely see the chat and I hope that I will see if somebody presses the raise hand button. But should you press the raise hand button and not get called on, uh, also tell me in the chat because it means something is broken. Okay, uh, with that said, do, are there any questions about the presentation we just saw? Uh, Brian? Uh I'm going to, hopefully you can hear me and there's not yes, I can. Ba background noise. If so, I'm going to mute it real quick. But 
it seems safe now. But I ju just curious, what 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 type of majors do you have in this? And um, well, that, that's my first question. The second one is, um, do you ever have anybody who actually gets into this more than just what you show them? Uh, so I'm going to go back and mute here. Okay. So the question was, what kind of majors are in? And you're talking about in this class, is that right? Okay. Um, so what kind of majors are in this class? And then, is anybody ever does it ever catch on with anybody and they go on to do, you know, something more? Um, the majors are primarily um, those aviation management flight operations students, uh, the ones working toward their pilot certification and, and, and a business degree. So they're, they're more or less business majors, but they're aviation focused business majors. Every now and then there'll be a student who comes in and decides to take it as their lab science requirement for the gen ed. Uh, one semester, I had a, uh, a dance major come in, and she just decided that it was interesting and sounded neat, and she had to take a lab science anyway, so she might as well take this one, um, which meant when I brought out all the airplanes, she didn't really have a personal connection with that. Um, but no, it, it is mostly these, these uh, 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 flight majors. Um, as far as getting interest, um, I did have one student, uh, I guess this was about 10 years ago, who um, was really interested in, and wanted to take on... Um, an aviation physics research project as his honors project. Um, so the honors students have to do um, some sort of capstone research project and, and write a report on it, give a presentation. And so he actually, uh, we, had a, we had an old wind tunnel that had been built about 20 years earlier by some students and was collecting dust. And he took that, he put some model airplane wings inside of it. He had a pretty neat apparatus for measuring um, the, the, the lift force on the wing because he would just attach a force sensor and then crank up the, the wind and then watch the, you know, watch the force readings change. Um, after that, I haven't really had too many that were interested. Um, this was, I should also say, this was my first time teaching the course in, uh, in several years um, since I've had some other teaching priorities. So uh, not, not in the last couple of years though, that, that in my 12 years at, at Jacksonville, that's, that's been the only student. And awesome. Any more questions? Nobody raises yes, their yes, hand. Uh, I, have a, I have a question. <clears throat> Hello? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, could, you, could you speak a little bit about the different interfaces that can be used? You use uh, Python uh, in the classroom. You use Trinket. But is there some merit to using a Jupyter Notebook or just uh, a standalone something like idle or mm -hmm. uh, what is it that they use? Um, sure. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so my so, primary reason for using Trinket in this class is to avoid having to have the students do any kind of installation, um, both because um, today's students are not very experienced with installing software. That's not something they've grown up doing, um, but also because uh, then if they're on a university computer and they don't have administrative rights, they can't install anything. So for this particular class, Trinket, uh, Trinket or Glowscript.org is, is kind of most appropriate just because it all runs in the web browser. It doesn't require any kind of um, installation. Um, I did use Jupyter Notebooks last year in my um, computational research methods class for my uh, sophomore and junior physics majors. And it, it took us a couple of weeks to get things installed because a couple of them had um, uh, uh, Apple laptops. And so I, I, I had to overcome a learning barrier there because I've never installed anything on a Mac before. Um, but that, that's neat because it, you know, it obviously has the ability to combine the code with the write-up and it's all just one smooth, continuous thing. Whereas with Trinket, you do your write-up and then you just kind of paste the link in and say, here, uh, click on this code or click on this link and run the code. Um, so yeah, I, I probably wouldn't use something like Jupyter Notebooks or Idle for this particular class, um, just because of all the extra overhead it would introduce. Yeah, as somebody who went through the headache of installing a Jupyter Notebook for his computational physics class, I, I hear you, it was yeah. painful. Yeah, um, and to get everybody up to speed, it's very difficult. But I recently discovered Trinket and it seems for small stuff, it seems too good to be true, you know? Yeah. But it, it requires no installation, no preparation, really. It just is ready to go. And, and so. I suppose if you really, if somebody really wanted their students to, to embed the code in a write-up, they 
could have them do it on some kind of web page or blog or wiki or something like that and then just embed the, the, the trinket code because you can do that in a website relatively easily. Right. Now, and uh, one more question. Uh, how, do you, how do you envision implementing something like this in an intro physics course where we're talking about, I don't know, 80 students in a classroom? Mm -hmm. Is this something that is uh, scalable? Is it something that applies to a group of students? that are not as specialized, let's say, as uh, aviation students. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so as, far as, as far as there being a larger class of, of say, 80 students, um, my classes typically run 15 to 20. Um, so I would probably be employing some uh, junior, senior learning assistants at that point, um, or at the very least then maybe pushing some of the coding outside the class a bit, um, and then maybe ha hooking them up with tutors or some video tutorials or something. Um, I have had some, some luck with uh, creating some video tutorials and having the students watch those before class. And a good number of my students will watch the tutorial and come into class and say, can I try this thing? And it's something that, you know, that they thought of while they were watching the video. And I say, yeah, go for it. You give that a try. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the fact that they're thinking in terms of, um, I can get the code to do the thing that I want is is impressive. You know, if, if we can get them to just think that way, that's more valuable than, you know, than remembering the ins and outs of how to set up a for loop. Um, as far as the diverse student interests, um, I try to incorporate that at the end of the semester with, a, with an end of semester project where uh, we don't have any new material for a couple of weeks and the students get the time in class to work with each other and consult with me on some uh, you know, some, some thing that they're going to model in the code. Um, we've actually had a, a, a recent influx of kinesiology majors, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to getting them to try doing some stuff to model, you know, body movement and things like that. Um, and I think that's kind of the neat thing is about uh, the computational physics being incorporated into the intro sequence is that the students can model all that messy real world stuff that we can't solve on the board. Um, and we just, you know, we just have to develop the infrastructure to to support them with it. That sounds like this, uh, this is a really good discussion and it's kind of moving from uh, specific to general. So that to me signals that it might be time to move over into a more broad moderated discussion. Um, but I do want to pause here and just say uh, if there are more specific questions uh, for Brian, this would be a good time um, to throw them in and then maybe we can hand over to Nick for the moderated discussion. All right, I'm so, hearing a lot of silence, so I'm hoping that that, I, oh, no, never mind, there we go. Yeah, so I, I just had a brief question okay. for Brian. Um, so I was wondering if you do any kind of assessment with uh, your students, like whatever they produce, is there an assessment component of your course, if you could speak about that? Yeah, it kind of depends. It depends on the activity and it depends on the course. So like I mentioned, for, for, these, for this aviation course where, I tell them I'm not expecting you to learn any coding. I'm just expecting you to use it the way you would use a graphing calculator. Um, I, I don't necessarily grade their codes for correctness. I, I inspect them in class, you know, and I say, do you really think this thing is going to blow up to infinity like that? Don't you think it should maybe level off? Maybe you have a minus sign wrong somewhere. Um, but that's also usually at the level that I know what the answer should look like in general, and I know how it can go wrong. Um, for a for for a, for a more technical class like 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 a calculus-based physics course, um, then I would be inspecting the code for correctness, but I would be ramping up the expectation for that as a semester goes on, where the first week, okay, maybe the answer's right, maybe it's wrong, but you got the code to run and that's good enough. And then, but then by the end of the semester, yeah, you better be getting the right answer and you better be graphing the total energy and that total energy better be constant because you know by now that if that total energy is not constant, you've got something wrong. Thanks. All right. Well, I think uh, I think I'm going to hand things over to Nick uh, for the time being. But uh, thanks again to Brian for a really interesting presentation. And thanks for having me. This, I'm sure people will have more questions yet as we get to the broader discussion, and you may be mm -hmm. able to answer yet more things. <laughs> okay. Um, so I, what I guess the plan is for the rest of uh, our meeting today is sort of just to discuss as a group, uh, some of these ideas around how we implement things. Um, and I, I wanted to just share really quick, uh, I, so what I've done 
Let's see if I can get this to share. There we go. Okay, so um, this is, those of you that have been to a, a, one of the faculty development workshops or have been around uh, Danny for very long um, have seen this before. This is this computational implementation space, right? And you sort of have on your x-axis, you sort of have um, the, the interaction with code um, and or the programming aspect. And then on the y-axis, you have uh, different parts of the course. And so you can sort of think about how you, um, how you integrate computation into different parts of the course. Um, I, I've come up with, for, to hopefully help guide our discussion today a little bit, uh, a version of this where I've, I've sort of replaced the y-axis here. And I'm calling this my uh, computational science skill space, um, where you sort of have two components to this. You have programming skills, um, and then you have sort of the numerical methods side of things. And, um, you know, the numerical methods idea is, is how do you actually uh, numerically solve equations or, or you know, do physics, right? And then the programming is how do you actually make the computer do what you want? Um, and, and for the numerical methods, I have everything from homemade, meaning you write the algorithm from scratch, which really means that you pull out numerical recipes and, and find the algorithm you want and then translate it into whatever programming language you're talking about, um, to all the way down to it's basically a black box. Uh, you don't understand it. The student doesn't understand the numerical method, they simply understand that it's integrating or it does a, it, it fits the parabola to my data. Um, and uh, so, so anyway, I, I, I hope this sort of helps our, our discussion a little bit maybe to think about how do we, how do we connect the activities that we're doing uh, to, to integrate computation? Um, where do they, where do they land on this thing? And I, I don't, I don't mean to um, present this as like a good is on one side and bad is on the other. Uh, this is really more of a, you know, where do you, how much time and energy do you want to invest in, in different things? Um, obviously writing code, from, writing a homemade uh, Rungakutta solver from scratch is going to be a much larger investment of course time, student time, your energy, um, than it is if you simply say, hand them a code that uh, does it all under the hood. Um, so anyway, that, that was sort of the first thing I wanted to, to mention. And then I'll also say that um, when we're teaching these classes, um, I, I want to kind of focus our discussion on classes that aren't designed to teach numerical methods or, or programming. Um, so I'm sort of excluding from this your, uh, the course that a lot of us teach, which is really the, you know, whatever level it's at, but the course that's designed to teach physics majors how to program and, and understand numerical techniques. Um, so instead, what, what I kind of like to focus our discussion is, what do we do with courses where the goal of the course is not programming or computation? Uh, how can we sort of implement in? And I think Brian's example was great because it was a course where you have aviation, you know, business majors who aren't particularly, the, the, the goal of the course is not to teach them how to be programmers. Uh, it's to teach them some physics that has to do with, with aviation. Um, but it's not designed uh, that's not the learning objective, right? The, the, the objective of the course is not, uh, I want them all to understand how, uh, you know, how time integration of differential equations work. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I, I guess the, the first question that I'll ask to sort of kick off discussion is um, when we're, when we're teaching and we bring in some computational uh, tools or, or methods, um, 
is teaching the numerical techniques and or programming part of the point or can you can you be happy teaching bringing in these computational techniques and tools without teaching your students the, the programming or the, the numerical techniques Uh, Nick, just to start off, you, did you did you finish your question? Yes, I did. Uh, let's see here. I, I guess I can't see the chat for a moment. There we go. Oh, oh, I didn't know. If, go um, ahead. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I, um, it of course depends on on what what you're wanting to accomplish. Uh, just personally, from my point of view, uh, I like to. It, it, if I'm going to do this in the intro classes, for sure. I like to have the students understand what's under the hood. And then once, once that's been demonstrated, then I don't mind them using some of the built-in uh, computational black boxes. So that's just my two cents to start things out. Ansel, was that a hand up? You wanted to make a comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was just going to say, uh, I'm thinking about this mostly in the context of I'm teaching a quantum class this term, and we're doing some Jupyter Notebook stuff in class. And it's very much a, you know, kind of modify a minimally working program, or even just run the animation and play with, uh, you know, a couple of parameters. Um, and in that, in that context, I think there's a sort of an intermediate ground, where I'd like to have the code in front of them, because they're upper division students, right? And uh, have it something that they can look at and kind of at least look over and have a general sense of how it's working and maybe look into a little bit more on their own time since they're also like pretty self-motivated. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're struggling a lot with the physics concepts. So I want them to really lean into the physics for what we're doing in class. So I think there's some extent to which like uh, sort of, you know, showing them that a technique exists is helpful. Uh, just so that they understand that we're solving a bunch of analytically tractable things in class, but that there is this larger class of things that they can also solve um, using some computational method, and that if they want to come ask me questions about it after class, or if they see something of interest in it, uh, they should feel free to grab that code and use it in any other context. Um, and especially for the upper division students, many of whom are seniors and going on to grad school and things like that, there's a bunch of them that grab onto that pretty fast. Um, so I think it you know, depends a lot, like Kelly was saying, on the, on the audience, right? Yeah, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll take the opposite viewpoint uh, to Kelly there that I am often happy if my students don't understand the numerics in the same way that I'm happy that my students don't understand how an accelerometer works, that they can just take an accelerometer and figure out that yes, it does measure acceleration and then go to work with it. Um, so I'm, I, I, for particularly in intro classes, a lot of times when I, hand them these when I hand them code or have them do numerical tasks I'm I'm happy if they don't necessarily understand how the tool that I gave them works they just understand that it does now the nice thing is then that often leads in for some of the students some of the students will just sort of okay fine and we'll move on um, but but some small fraction of them will get interested and want to understand how did it do that um, and and then that can lead on right but well so well i'll say that oftentimes you do want the students to understand the programming or the numerical techniques a little bit i i think i'm in, in a number of cases i'm fine if they don't i'm fine if it's just a tool and, uh, and Nick, uh, by the way i apologize if there's voices so i'm going to try to to mute as soon as i've said my piece but i um you're, you're tiptoeing around just I, I, I so everybody understands this is a core value of, of the pickup by the way is that we'll support whatever faculty want to do and what it comes right down to is what your goals are for your own students and so there's no right or wrong in this it's just we all have different pedagogical styles as phys physics teachers especially we don't trust what each other does and we choose our own thing that might not be the best way to put it but that's true to some extent uh, you know we all know better than everybody else um, but that, that's, that's how it works, and that's what we want to support. So, there, so again, I'm just trying to point out there's no best way to do this stuff. Yeah, and, and um, I guess maybe part of the, the, the point is that, 
that there are a bunch of different approaches and and um, you can figure out which which argument you like better. Um, so I, I'm just curious, Nick. I, and yeah. I just maybe because there's there's ten or eleven participants on. I'm just curious. Maybe vote via chat. Who 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 likes to take the uh, the under the hood approach versus who likes to take I don't know for lack of a better term computational black box approach or both? Do you use both? I don't know. Is is it possible to, to use the chat as a vote thing? Real quick? You know what? I can actually I can actually make a poll real quick. Uh, this is nice because I was planning on. Yeah, that's a good idea. This. Um, okay, so I'm going to make this anonymous. To see, you know? So um, uh, do you use computational methods as black boxes under the hood or both? Okay. This is great uh, audio, I'm sure, listening to me do this. But let's see if this works. OK, if I hit save and launch a poll, there, does that, that pop something up for everybody? Yes. All right. So we'll give people a moment to, to respond, and then, uh, and then I can let everybody see the results. I see. Okay, well, we've got, uh, let's see, that's eight of us. So we'll give people another five seconds or so to, to respond and then we'll, we'll, I'll reveal the results. I'm abstaining because I don't teach. <laughs> All right. I'm on the edge of my seat, by the way. I don't know if you can tell or not, but I'm yeah. waiting with it breath. It okay. would be interesting to maybe get the do a poll of students sometime too and see which way they prefer better. Yeah, absolutely. That would be. It would also be fun to it would be interesting to see what my students think I want them to do. Okay, so here's the results. Uh, so most people are in the both category. Um, and then there aren't very many. There's one black boxer out there. Um, I would definitely, I, I couldn't vote because I made the poll, but I would definitely put myself in the both category. Um, just, it, it depends a lot on the course I'm teaching. Um, okay, so let's stop that. Okay, so uh, maybe for the next, uh, the, the next sort of discussion topic, um, maybe we could think about some examples of, uh, so think of an example that from a class you're, you're teaching um, or have taught uh, where you wanted to integrate something computational in and uh, kind of think through the process of how you did that, right? How did you decide, okay, this is the thing I want to do. This is the, how I want to bring in the numerical piece. Uh, you know, this is how I actually implemented it and how did it go? So I'll, I'll, I'll start just with an example from, a course that I'm teaching right now. Uh, it's a junior level classical mechanics course. And um, the thing that all, I love about classical mechanics is that you can always get the equation, uh, you, the differential equation, right, for the motion of some crazy system you've dreamt up. But uh, generally, the fun ones aren't analytically solvable. And so what I've done is I have pre-written a Python script um, where my students can modify the equations being solved and then just run it. So all they have to do is modify the equations um, and then hit run and it will generate the, the it'll solve the, the differential equation uh, that they put in. And of course, they have to understand it enough to know where the equations are in this script and in what form they should be. Um, but it's a pretty minimal modification of the code. And then, uh, and then they just have to know enough to know how to save the plots that it generates. And so it's a very, in terms of, they don't have to understand the numerical technique. They have to modify the code um, 
they do have to understand uh, from a conceptual standpoint what it is that the code wants. So the code wants a system of first order differential equations. And they need to understand what that means. Um, they also have to understand, and actually this is the biggest challenge that I found, they have to understand that the, what the modification means has to go, so the variables have to come in in the same order that the right hand sides go out, um, which is the, the single biggest uh, problem that people have is that they mix up, you know, they have the position as the first thing that coming into their function and the right hand side for position is second. And so uh, they get weird results, and they don't understand it and they, they come show me. Um, but the nice thing is that it allows them to see the solutions for equations that they wouldn't otherwise be able to solve. Um, and it, it allows that without, so these are students that haven't, some of them have had a programming class and some of them have even had a computational physics course, but uh, a lot of them, this is, they, they've just sort of seen bits and pieces of Python here and there in different classes. Um, so that's, that's my sort of example. Uh, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so so I, I like what you've described there, where you're having them, you know, study a, a, an unsolvable problem, which is really showing them the value of why we do all this programming stuff. Um, I was curious. I, I wanted to hear if you could talk about um, what kind of follow-up questions do you ask them when they when they put in the differential equation for a problem that can't be solved? They get out their graph that does whatever crazy non-analytical things it's going to do. What what kind of questions do you ask them to answer about that? So um, I'll give you an example from, from one we actually did uh, this week. So we, uh, we got, it was a problem, we're talking about um, conserved quantities and we're getting into Lagrangian, the Lagrangian formalism and showing that if you choose the right coordinate system, you get out a conserved quantity fairly easily. And so we did a problem where angular momentum should be conserved. Um, and so I had them, I had them basically code it up, put the equations in, run the thing. Um, and then I had them say, okay, if you choose the right uh, angular momentum here, you should be able to get this thing to move in a circle, right? Because if you just pick random stuff, it, it, they're all ellipses. You pick the right angular momentum and now it'll be circular motion. And so figure out what angular momentum you should give it and make me a circle. And, um, and, and they like it because it actually works, right? It actually, if they, if they plug the right value in for their initial condition for their angular momentum, it, it actually does give them a nice, it gives them a really boring graph, right? The radius is just constant. Um, but they get really excited about it because then they realize it. So um, that's the main thing I do is I use it to sort of uh, verify special cases, right? Which are usually the only things you can do analytically is you can look at, okay, what hap where are the equilibrium points? What happens near equilibrium? And I'll get them to be, okay, what if I don't give it this nice equilibrium solution? What happens, you know? And then if you do give it, verify that it actually works. Okay, um, it would, would anybody else, anybody else have a, an activity or a way they're using things that they'd like to share? I'll put you all on the spot here. Well, I'd like to ask a question. Oh, go ahead. Do you have access to things like Mathematica in your classes? And you know, you said you chose to use Python. I'm wondering how you pick that versus uh, something like Mathematica. Um, so, uh, we do have access to Mathematica. We have a, a campus site license for it. Um, the reason that I chose Python, it, it, that's sort of been a department choice. Um, we've sort of, uh, sort of consolidated around one programming language, just so that in the bits and pieces of programming that different people are trying to integrate in at different sort of haphazard points, we're seeing, the students are seeing a common first language. Because our, our physics majors 
uh, don't aren't required to take a programming class at any point. Um, and, and so a lot of them have no programming experience whatsoever. And so they get hung up on concepts like syntax and things like that. So the, the, the choice of Python is simply because that's sort of what as a department we decided to do, uh, largely because it's free. Um, is, is really the real, uh, the real winning factor for Python. Um, that being said, we could very easily have chosen to do this in Mathematica or to chosen to do this, uh, you know, chosen to use GlowScript or, or any of a variety of other things. Um, Python was just chosen because it was, uh, it was, it was easy to get access to. We, um, we've got it. We have it installed on all of our uh, can't, all of our department computers, and uh, and it, you know the price was right. So mostly, I teach computational physics rather than particular physics course when I use computation, and I like to make sure my students, or I split the course between. Uh, compiled languages or you know something like Python would be acceptable and Mathematica and I like to introduce the students to the idea of least time to solution find the tool that will get you to the answer and the insight you want with the least amount of work or the least time yeah that, that's actually an important point and, and it's one that um, that I I try to make when I when I bring these computational bits into a lot of my other classes is that the computation should be a help to understanding, right? You can just throw things in and make solutions. Um, and they, they're, they're probably even right, but just, you know, randomly doing stuff usually doesn't help you understand anything. If you, if you're going to bring in the computational bit into the class, in, in my view, it, it should, uh, it should, mesh well with the analytical pieces you're doing and, and hopefully if you've got any experimental pieces um, and and they should all sort of help students understanding of the the concepts and the tools you're using um, that's hard <laughs> I'll say that oftentimes I think something is going to help and and I find that that uh, what it's actually done is it's gotten people really focused on some bit of minutia that I you know, to me is obviously unimportant, but to them they think is extremely important. Um, I find that students get really, really interested in how they can control details of the plots they generate. Um, and they really want to know, how do I make it a blue line? How do I, how do I change the color scheme? And, and I'm like, you know, it doesn't matter, guys. Just, you know, does it tell you something? Um, but, you know, the, I, I don't really have a, a solution to that. Uh, more than just a, a trial and error thing and finding that students, you know, will get hung up on one thing or another. And then, you know, the next time I can sort of hopefully prepare for it. Um, Ansel, go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, I was just going to say in, in the terms of like ways to use code in class, um, a couple of so like I said, I've been doing a lot of Jupyter notebook stuff and having students mess with things. But uh, actually, a couple of the more successful things that I've done have been for very, very small problems. Uh, things like, you know, let's let's just like plot all the terms of this equation that we're working with uh, so that we can see what they're doing. Or, you know, things that I could probably honestly just open up like Wolfram Alpha and do it. But I'll pull up a Trinket window instead. Um, and I'll actually type it out live in front of the class and ask them what things I should plug in. You know, here I am, I'm making this function. What should I plug in for the amplitude? What should I plug in for these arguments? Um, and part of it, is just because that's the tool that I feel comfortable with is I'm like very comfortable with Python programming. But part of it is also that one of the things I'm trying to teach them is that code is a tool that you can reach for, for lots and lots of different things, even if those things, um, you know, are not a very large complicated physics simulation. Even if those things are like, let's make a plot or let's try simulating 10,000 random numbers for this and plug it into this thing and see what our histogram looks like, right? Um, and that's been very helpful, I think, because it shows them start to finish in a very small bite-sized chunk how to, for example, like write out a function, uh, which you can then use multiple times. Um, and it's nice also because I can use it, it's kind of like both this and the Jupyter Notebooks are kind of like a laboratory for a case where we do not and cannot have a lab. Um, so for example, 
you know, there's no lab experiment that you can do uh, to look at the real and imaginary parts of a wave function. Uh, certainly not in the like five minutes that I want to spend looking at the real and imaginary parts of a wave function, uh, but I can do it like on the screen. Um, and that's really helpful because then we can have the back and forth that one might have with a lab demo of, okay, what should I plug in here? Oh, let's try it. What do you predict is going to look like? Let me try plugging in. Let me do it. Uh, and now discuss with your groups. Did that make sense? Does it not make sense? Etc. So sometimes I find that uh, doing things where the students actually aren't messing with the code, but are still having input into what goes into the code um, and are watching somebody code it has been really uh, successful in the sense that then they come up afterwards and they're like, oh, good, uh, let me mess with that. Um, can I try this? Can we do that? Uh, so it's, it's gotten a lot of enthusiasm and kind of prevents them from zooming off uh, in a direction that's going to take a lot of time at a point when I don't necessarily want them to go and take a lot of time. So it's, it's some, to some extent, a, a, it's not a black box, but it's, um, I'm, I'm opening the hood up and I'm doing the repair under the hood and they're watching me do it once in the hopes that then when they have to do it subsequently, it's somewhat less intimidating. Yeah, I, I also, just to highlight uh, back to our discussion earlier, what, what Ansel sort of described there was sort of this subversive learning objective of, of you know, we're gonna, we're gonna sneak in the computation. It's an objective, we're not gonna tell the students that, or maybe not gonna tell our colleagues that, we're, that, that, that we want it. We're trying to make them comfortable with code um, but we are, and and I actually I actually like that. That's one of the reasons that I like to use um, I like to use Python, and I I generally use it in in an IDE like Spider because it looks like fancy code magic, right? And and part of what sort of my my unstated subversive learning objective is, is I don't want students to be afraid of that. I don't want students to look at it and think, ah, I have no idea what this is or how it works. And, and some of that is just gained by familiarity, right? It's the same way that I don't want them to be afraid of, what a, of a derivative, so I make a point of saying the word derivative a lot. Um, it's this sort of subversive learning objective, right? Where I'm trying to, in, a, in an unstated way, uh, you know, change their sort of perception or attitude about something. Um, to maybe go back to your original question, though, about, you know, how, how do we introduce the computation without it turning into a numerical methods class? Um, when, when I teach my students what the code is doing, I don't teach it as, oh, this is numerically integrating a second order differential equation. I just say, this is the velocity formula, and this is the position formula, and you've worked with those, and now we're just putting them in the code and having it do it over and over again. So I'm Kind of like you were talking about, I'm, I'm subversively sneaking in this numerical technique, but I'm presenting it as, this is a formula you know from your book, we're just putting it into the code and letting it run. Yeah, I'll, I also, um, like for example, uh, when, when we get to, um, in, in my uh, lower division mechanics class, when we get to the pendulum, right, the pen, the, we've done the simple harmonic oscillator, right, and I've, I've scared them all out of their shorts by saying that this is a differential equation where I'm going to solve a differential equation. And they think that I've done something horrible because they don't have differential equations yet. Um, but then I, then I show them, okay, this is what happens if we put in a differential equation that you will never be able to solve analytically. Um, but it's okay. The computer knows how. And I, and I, and I show them that it's this, it's this basic idea that they learned going back to the very beginning of calculus, that we're just going to say a derivative is just a difference between two points divided by the spacing between them, right? And so I'm using the stupidest definition of a derivative possible, and look, it makes the solution to, my, to this nasty, horrible thing that you think is going to eat you. Um, and so, so I'm, but, but again, my goal there isn't to teach them about finite difference schemes. My goal is simply to say, okay, this can solve an equation for you. And, and so you can, you know, you can use it to solve the equation. And what well, happens when they apply the Euler algorithm to the simple harmonic oscillator? Well, what, what happens is that they think it works great as long as they get two periods on there, right? And they'll look at it too deeply. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, 
the the my my general solution for a lot, particularly in the intro mechanics, is I'm just going to beat it. Computers are fast, right? I'm just going to give okay, give it a million points. Who cares, right? It'll take 17 milliseconds to run. Um, so, so you know, I, I I sort of cheat to avoid having to talk about okay, this algorithm isn't as good as we could do a better one, right? Um, Yeah, and then, but but I will say that when I get to my upper level classes, so for example, uh, today we looked at, we were looking at that case where angular momentum should be conserved. And, um, and I actually had them ask, is, it, is this actually producing a perfect circu circular motion? And I said, basically, okay, zoom in a lot, right? Zoom, 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 zoom. Oh, it didn't. Why didn't it? What, what could we change, right? And I basically showed them, okay, if we, if we, uh, I'm using a package, I'm using scipy.integrate, which has a, a nice differential equation solver in it. And I basically show them, okay, right now we're using this RK45, whatever that means, right? Let's choose a different one and let's see what it does. And voila, it does a better job. Why? Well, come take my computational class and we'll talk about error on numerical schemes. Uh, Ansel, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, actually I feel like the times when the students can figure out how to break something is like one of the more fun times with computation because they can't, they can't break mathematics in a fun way in most cases, right? Like there are a few cases, but for the most part, it's, uh, you know, if they mess up, it just feels bad like they messed up and they're sad. Um, but uh, with, with computation, you know, even with my upper division students, I give them a Jupyter notebook that shows, uh, you know, all the different uh, states of the harmonic oscillator. And the first thing they do is they try to plug in like n equals 10 billion just to see if they can break it, right? And of course they can, you know, and then we talk about like what's the resolution on this thing, you know, what, what are we doing? Um, but I feel like it's, that's actually, that's actually often a good like, um, number one, a, a good thing to like incentivize them to start playing around with the code and to understand that they can change parameters and that they can like, there's some interest in playing with it and treating it as a game. Um, and then sometimes they'll actually break something in a way that reveals uh, something about the method or about the physics. And then instead of telling them, you know, we're doing this uh, numerical integration thing in the following way and it has the following limitations, uh, I can say, oh, you just found a limitation, right? And then they're interested in listening to that as opposed to, you know, me telling them what the, the rails are on this, uh, you know, on, on this integration. Um, they find it for themselves and that's, that's more fun, I think. Plus, it makes them feel good whenever they break anything I made or you know brought them. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was just gonna uh, follow up on what Stephen asked about uh, applying Euler to an oscillatory uh, uh, system. Um, even with in introductory students, I this is so this is a little bit of a plug for my style. Uh, I actually like them to discover things like this that something goes horribly wrong with their with what they think they've gotten down at now. And so, so uh, uh, simple harmonic oscillator is the prototypical example of this. It goes to hell in a handbasket if you try to do Euler with it. Um, and it's, it's actually enjoyable to watch them try to correct it by lowering delta T. But eventually I keep telling them, take it out further, take it out further, and it just dawns on them that something's terribly wrong. And I think that's okay, even at that, even if your goal is not to do algorithms with them, but just to make the point that you've got to be paranoid with this stuff because the computer really doesn't know how to do this. The computer is only going to do what you do it. And if you tell it not to, if you tell it to do it in a not correct or not good approximate way, then you're going to get nonsense. Out. So uh, I just wanted to follow what Steve, Steve had said. So that's, but, but again, it comes back to what is the purpose and what you want your students to do. Uh, but I think it's okay for them to discover that this doesn't work all the time. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just add real quick that, that this is actually, I, I like doing this. So one of my pet uh, projects is I, I want physicists to think of computation in the same way they think of experimentation in, a, in an educational setting. And so I, I like this in the, uh, in the setup good, of- Good point, good point. Of, 
Like I want my students to figure out the limitations on the accelerometer I hand them, right? I want them to figure out that for some reason it says it's accelerating downwards at 9.8 meters per second squared when it's not. Um, and, and why? And okay, you don't have to understand, uh, you, you know, general relativity, but I do want you to understand the limitation of the tool you're given. And so, um, so that, and, and the nice thing about computation is it's usually pretty easy to break things. Um, it's usually pretty easy to find some special case or, or you know, uh, let's see what happens if I do 800 cycles of this uh, harmonic oscillator um, and, then it, and then gets into some of these, these limitations. I'll also say that this, is, this plays in nicely to uncertainty, right? That's one of the concepts that's in almost everybody's learning objectives, right? Is we want to understand, we want the students to appreciate this concept of uncertainty and how measurements are uncertain. It's also nice to talk about how theoretical predictions are uncertain. So that, that's a good tool there. Well, we are at uh, a little over an hour, so we probably better um, close the meeting here. Um, I, I, uh, I wanted to thank everybody for coming and, and, uh, and participating. And um, yeah, I guess our next meeting uh, our next one is scheduled for November 14th. Uh, that one will be late for you East Coast people. It's at 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific, so 10 o'clock Eastern. So, you know, um, get a nap. Uh, any, anything else? We, we, any other questions, comments, concerns, thoughts? I just, I just want to make a, a quick comment. Um, number one, uh, we're looking for uh, volunteers to present or to lead discussions for subsequent synchronous meetings. Um, so that is, and that's a very open slate. Uh, so for it, basically, if you have an idea for a topic that you want to discuss, whether it's something that you've put together already and are using, or even if it's something that you really just want to have a group discussion about because you're looking for more feedback and ideas about some particular issue within uh, this computational integration space, uh, very open to that, um, and I think there's a sign-up document on the Slack channel, um, which we should probably like resend out. Um, and uh, yeah, and then uh, I think that's that's basically it. Um, oh, and uh, of course we have the Slack channel, so people should continue to you know chat uh, uh, about the stuff that we talk about in the synchronous meetings, and you know boost it uh, on the pick up Slack. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Yeah. We'll see you next time. Thank, thanks for sharing, Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Nick Anato. Thanks. Thanks to everybody who's here.